I'm Pat Collins, and welcome to Incredible Indies. We're focusing on women who work on screen and behind the camera. Allison Janney joins us with Tales of the West Wing and her recent film, The Way Way Back. Oscar winner Octavia Spencer explains her commitment to films like Fruitvale Station. An Academy Award winning producer reveals the findings of a new study about gender and opportunity in Hollywood. We'll test your indie IQ, all that, plus a roundtable discussion about the role of women in indies. A character actor is defined as one who plays a supporting role, not a leading role. Alice and Janney ranks high on the list of popular and in-demand character actresses. She recently earned rave reviews for The Way Way Back. Betty, the chatty life of the party lush, befriends her summertime next door neighbors Steve Carell, Tony Collette, and Tony's awkward 14-year-old son Duncan. Here's how Allison describes herself as a kid. I was ridiculously tall, so I was always felt uncomfortable and awkward, and and um, I just have to thank my parents for making me take you know ballet and modern dance and and figure skating, and because I learned to stand up tall and and um, stand up straight and and uh, be graceful. For seven years, Allison walked the halls of the West Wing and won four Primetime Emmy Awards playing presidential press secretary C.J. Gray. I got offered jobs as, you know, working at different networks. You do know that I'm just an actress. I'm playing this part. I don't know anything about press. I'm like, it was kind of, it was fun. I thought, well, I took that as a compliment, you know. Oh. You brought me a man, how thoughtful. For Allison, the most challenging scene in The Way Way Back is her long monologue. Well, Betty in The Way Way Back, this part is, was probably one of the most exhausting characters I've ever played, and I didn't see that coming. I kind of, I, I read the first scene, and, the, and I got so excited about getting the opportunity to, to jump into her, into that character, and, and I, I just, uh, I was shocked at how <laughs> exhausted I was after every take. Allison's memorable films include the award-winning The Help and Juno. But does she dream of starring in a big-budget action movie? You know, I don't know why there's not more in the big commercial movies. Um, but um, until there are, I'm going to keep doing them in the uh, indie world and, and hope sometime I'll cross over and do a big, kick-ass, you know, big-budget <laughs> movie. This is my son, Duncan. I was going to name my youngest Duncan, but we went with Peter. Finally. Fix his lazy eye, now it's even worse. Boop, boop. Wow. Just stare at the bridge of his nose, that's what I do. You're the worst parent. There's a message in the skies and in the street. Allison was encouraged to pursue an acting career by Paul Newman, who directed her in a play at Kenyon College, their same alma mater. <music> Kathy Schulman, the Academy Award-winning producer of Crash and a top Hollywood executive, is also one of the film industry's leading authorities on opportunities for women behind the camera. I spoke to Kathy at her office in Los Angeles. Kathy Schulman has been president of Mandalay Pictures since 2007, overseeing a variety of films, including the Oscar-nominated The Kids Are All Right and the critically praised Bernie, starring Jack Black, Shirley MacLaine, and Matthew McConaughey. As one of an elite group of women who head self-financed production companies, Kathy is the exception to the rule in Hollywood. A recent study commissioned by the L.A. branch of Women in Film and the Sundance Institute examined gender disparity in the movie business. There were some surprising results. Women are being stopped um, by primarily male-controlled networks of financing. So what it really means is that women are not being given the necessary funding to do the projects that they want to do. And this was happening across many different, you know, platforms, studios, networks, agency support, et cetera. Sitcoms, but blockbusters. Yeah, some kind of a blockage between available funding and that funding going to women. Bottom line, is it all about the money? There are two prominent mythologies that came up over and over in terms of all of the subjective questioning and all of the objective statistics that were collected. And that and those two things are these. Number one, women are emotional, being emotional is a bad thing, and bad emotional people can't control money. So the second mythology that I think was unearthed 
um, from this study is this, that women are so busy juggling home, family, husbands, and work that we run a risk that they will not be able to manage the money correctly because they're so busy multitasking. Once again, when we compare that kind of a statement to all the data that was actually collected, we don't find women utilizing any of these terms about multitasking, having to do too much, finding trouble with the balance, except a small, small percentage. And as a matter of fact, of the top five reasons where, where, why women felt they were having trouble accessing financing, it's the very bottom reason. So some kind of a weird myth that women can't both manage money and multitask, or some fear of multitasking, or some belief that multitasking is a bad thing. Ready, everybody? Let's roll camera. Bye. In 2008, Catherine Bigelow won an Oscar for The Hurt Locker. She was the first woman director to hold the coveted award. Did Bigelow's achievement open Hollywood studio gates for other women directors? No. Women directors, as a general group, if we wanted to stereotype, we would discover that many women are interested in narrative storytelling that has to do with the intimacy of human experience. That said, there's no suggestion that that excludes also having an interest in movies that would make money, be exciting to watch, that have active characters, that have characters who are exaggerated, caricatured, um, comic book-like, etc. There is ob definitely some kind of an obstacle for women getting those jobs. We've heard repeated stories that women's names aren't even on the list. I mean, what does that mean? So whenever a director job comes up, there's going to be a list that's generated by that financier to figure out which director should get this job. And what we find more and more is that no women are even on these lists. Now that's multi-tiered problem too because how many women can be on a list when there's less than 9% of films made over the last 11 years have involved women in any of these jobs, let alone directing. Only 41 distinct women have directed films in the top 100 films over the last 11 years. So in other words, of 1,100 films that have been in the top grouping of box office success over that period of time, only 41 distinct women have even directed them. 41 is a small, small number, and frankly a number where I could, and most people in the business, name these women on our hands and on our fingers, because they're such exceptions. Exceptions are the most wonderful thing, because we can see the possibility, but why are women directors exceptions? That's the part that upsets us. Kathy also serves as president of Women in Film. The organization encourages its members in the movie business to support each other. There are women sprinkled throughout the network of financing who can influence the hiring of women. The bigger question is, do they? Mm. And that is an interesting area. What I've found, you know, is that, that the women who are holding higher positions in the studio and network jobs, these are hiring positions, higher positions that also hire, <laughs> yes. that what is interesting to me is that I hear much more about assimilation than I do self-distinguishing, meaning that these women will say to me, I've got it going just fine. I've figured out what the guys here want to do. I like what they want to do. I'm happy to do what they want to do, and I'm doing just fine. And so then the question becomes, if you're willing to assimilate, and, and your fear is you'll get fired if you self-distinguish, -distinct are you going to take the chance to hire a woman? Now, we see some more, there, you know, Sony's been better at it than other places. It's a studio that's run by some women. Um, but overall, it's such a narrow margin, and that's what saddens me most, is that I want to reach out to my female colleagues at these companies and say, well, you're there. Can't you do something about it? You're in, I, look at, I'm a producer. I, I, I create things with artists, and we come to you to sell them. I can't make you hire me. I can't make you hire my female director. But why? Aren't you doing it anyway? Why aren't you seeking us out? And where are the most opportunities for women behind the camera? That Tinseltown glass ceiling is more easily broken in independent films. The bullseye for women in film is to focus on those women who have made successfully an independent film that has gathered eyeballs and some economic support and to help that woman transact into Hollywood.
into making movies that are bigger and wider and seen by more people. And that is the perfect sort of candidate for this transition. Do we think it's happening on its own? No. We'd like to see more of it. There are exceptions. Exceptions are fabulous. But we, we really aren't finished with our job until the exceptions are the norm. People say to me all the time, you know, what is your biggest goal for women in film? And I say to blow up the building and not be needed anymore. Because the truth is, this is all about evening up the playing fields. Right now, we're dealing with 9% women, 91% men. When we get to 50% women, 50% men, we're talking about something. And this isn't just about opportunity. It's about voice. Because if you don't have women at the table being creative, making choices, sharing ideas, sharing experiences, doing storytelling, how can you tell stories for half of the population? We are part of the norm, we are 50% of the norm, and we want to share the table. And that's what we're working on. We've just heard Kathy Schulman speak about the many challenges facing women who work in the film industry. And we're going to continue that conversation and with our panel of experts here in the studio. And so we welcome Emily Russo, who's co-president and co-founder of Zeitgeist Films. A Desiree Akavan, who's a New York writer and director. Michelle Stevenson, who's the co-founder of Rada Film Group. And Nilu Safia, who is producer of Eyes Up Here Productions. Welcome. It's good to have all of you with us today. And talk a little bit about um, the niche market. Uh, do you think that the, that is where perhaps women might uh, have more opportunity, is if you do uh, almost exclusively documentaries or short subjects or you know little mini comedies uh, is, is that is that a way to go well I do think that documentaries definitely there's more female filmmakers in documentaries than there are in narratives um, I'm not really sure if that's because it's easier easier to access that sort of material or if it's that the money maybe is less normally for documentaries, the budgets are lower, so it's a little easier that way. And I think that one of the bigger problems with women filmmakers is the idea that we're not entrusted with as big budgets or as much money as men might be. And I think that points back to the same issue that men are the ones normally giving the money or making that decision to green light a project and they might feel more comfortable putting that amount of money in the hands of another man. It's really about an issue of perception and it takes getting to know people at a different level to pierce through those stereotypes and that's why I go back again to it's by increasing the numbers in a very kind of strategic way that we can create change and shifts. Emily uh, is, her company is a distribution company. Uh, ju just explain how that works. I make a movie, I give it to you, then what happens? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't, re don't you actually give it to us. You, you have to buy might it. acquire it. Yes. <laughs> For a very um, high price, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll basically license the rights to a finished film, so we don't do production at Zeitgeist. Um, we just do distribution, which is enough. And we are basically responsible for getting the film out there to the marketplace. We'll open it in theaters, we'll sell it on DVD, we'll license it to broadcasters, and we'll market it. We'll create materials and uh, the advertising campaign and the trailer and strate you know, strategically figure out how and when to open the film and where and try to make it as successful as possible. Is there a way that the new technology can help advance the careers of women directors and, and writers uh, and producers? And I'm going to ask you about it because you uh, created uh, The Slope, uh, which is a web, webcast uh, uh, program. Uh, how did it come about and how successful uh, in, in terms of getting responses and perhaps offers uh, was that project for you. A classmate and I had just both emptied our bank accounts making short <laughs> films for school on you know 16 millimeter trying to be precious with every moment of it and uh, both of us got rejected from all the major film festivals and were you know bored and low and tired of overthinking things so we got together we just wrote out you know some funny ideas for shorts and we started shooting them. 
it ended up becoming the first episode of The Slope, but we screened it for our friends and they loved it. And then we got into a few film festivals with it. And then suddenly it was like, this costs nothing to make. This was the funniest, most gratifying process I've ever had. Why don't we just keep doing this? More importantly, there is the matter of the dog. And I would like 50% of him. 50% of a dog? Yes. I think that we can work it out in a week-by-week -week negotiation, but seeing as I still have the keys to your apartment, I would let myself in, have some snuggle time whenever I get lonely, and leave. So we did eight episodes like that, and it was really exciting. All of a sudden, uh, every day there were a couple more thousand hits, and then we start getting contacted you know, by the Huffington Post and The Guardian in the UK, and suddenly Out Magazine wanted to interview us, and it was never made with the intention of you know, I mean, around then it was only two, three years ago, but there weren't that many web series out there. So we did a Kickstarter campaign, and that's how we raised just $8,000 for our second season. We did eight more episodes, 16 total. Now, one year since we wrapped the whole series, I've been able to, you know, have the luxury of having a, having made a feature film. And that film was financed through I believe the reputation I earned just doing that series. Part of it is also, you know, there's this drive to want to tell stories that reflect your own experiences. And in the case of the film that I were, that's about to be released now, we're going to be a screening at the New York Film Festival. It's a, uh, we turn the camera on uh, my family and my son, uh, who was accepted to a private school here in New York City, and uh, we follow him and his experience, his educational journey from five, from five years old to graduation from high school. And it really uh, speaks to our struggles around um, being a family of color in a predominantly white and privileged environment, but it speaks to our personal experiences and what are the sacrifices we have to do um, to really um, gain the most opportunity that we see possible for our child. For a while he came back when he first got there and he wanted his name changed. He didn't want it to be Idris. Well, I sometimes get made fun of because they said, oh, you talk like a white boy and stuff at my basketball team. And um, that has resonated. Uh, Can you give us an example in what way it has Well, uh, we premiered at Sundance Film Festival. And since the festival, we've had over 600 requests for screenings, for community screenings with parents, families, mm -hmm. educators, um, and with youth, um, because somehow that personal story resonates to a larger group of people who feel, um, who want to see their stories told. But more than that, want to engage in a conversation where they can cre possibly create change. You're in this because you have uh, a passion for it, uh, and of course, a talent for it. Uh, why did you go into the business? I wanted to be able to reach w a wider audience with my work. And it wasn't necessarily about the money, it was just about, I felt like with theater, there's you know such a finite thing you can do, whereas with film, you have the possibility of at least reaching a little further. And so I made that switch, I think, a few years out of college, a couple years out of college and an opportunity just fell into my lap to go and be part of an independent film company and it worked out nicely. I learned a lot from there and was there for a few years and then came out and decided I wanna do my own work. And generally the things that I've always been passionate about tend to be women's stories or Middle Eastern stories. And that comes from my own background. It's the stuff that resonates the most with me. And so I also tend to work with a lot of women and Middle Eastern women. And that sort of, again, comes out of it naturally. And um, it's definitely, as you said, it's not, you don't go into it for the money. There is, of course, that balance of trying to figure out how to make a living while also working in the industry. And that's something that with Eyes Up Here right now, we're, we're trying to figure out if there is a way to maybe do something a little bit more commercial, still on the short film or web series angle, but using it as more of a brand-driven narrative content. It seems the key word that has come up today is perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going. Definitely. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, I wish you enormous success, all of you. You've all done incredible work. We'll be looking for more. And uh, we'll be right back. Time to test your indie IQ. Here's your first question. Name the superstar from Brooklyn and the 1984 Golden Globe winning movie she directed. The answers, Barbara Streisand and Yendel. 
Who was the first woman to head a major Hollywood studio? Sherry Lansing. She was appointed president of 20th Century Fox in 1980. Nora Ephron wrote and directed this popular 1993 romantic comedy, Sleepless in Seattle. In the 85-year history of the Academy Awards, only six African-American women took home an Oscar. One of them is Octavia Spencer, who won for the help. In her recent film, Fruitvale Station, Octavia plays Oscar Grant's mother, whose visit to her incarcerated son is one of the film's many emotionally powerful scenes. I love you, Oscar. You ain't love nothing. I do. And I'm praying for you. I like roles that uh, not only enlighten and educate, but provide a little bit of escapism. So uh, perhaps that's why I'm gravitating toward the heavier subject matter, but I, I usually gravitate towards something that I feel like needs to be talked about. All right, I'm gonna do it. I like roles that challenge me, um, that's for sure. I, I like roles that uh, not only enlighten and educate, but provide a little bit of escapism. When first offered the role in Fruitvale Station, Octavia turned it down. She did not know the film's young director and writer, Ryan Coogler. But she was familiar with the true and tragic story of Oscar Grant, an unarmed 22-year-old who was shot and killed by an Oakland, California transit cop right after midnight on New Year's Day, 2009. Ryan Coogler had an opportunity to write a film that was an indictment of our law enforcement, that could have been an indictment of our judicial system, but chose not to do that. He chose to focus on the young man himself. I just hope that they see Oscar Grant as a human being. We forget that these young lives are lives lost. They should not be expendable. Octavia volunteered to lower her salary for Fruitvale Station, and when lack of funds put the production in jeopardy, she joined forces with the film's producer, Forrest Whitaker, to raise money. The film star, Michael B. Jordan, told me Octavia provided emotional support as well. And she's funny. She, she, she's, um, you know, on such a heavy film, she pick and she found moments to really like lighten the mood and, and just you know, keep us smiling all the time when, you know, when uh, some of the subject matter wasn't so happy. After her Oscar win for The Help, Entertainment Weekly named Octavia one of the 25 funniest actresses in the business. But it is her heart-wrenching supporting performance in Fruitvale Station that may bring Octavia another Oscar nomination. I'll see you when you get home. Hey, ma, hold up. Let me get a hug, ma. Grant, hey, Ma, I can't get back a hug. to the visiting area, Grant. Hey, Ma, I'm sorry. Grant. Get out of here. Ma, I'm sorry. Let me just get a hug, Ma. Ma, let me just get a hug, Ma. Octavia's movie career began behind the scenes. She was a young intern on the set of The Long Walk Home, which starred Whoopi Goldberg. A number of actresses this year received glowing reviews for their respective performances in independent films. Here are a few who excelled in 2013. I'm Cecil Gaines. I'm the new brother. Oprah returned to the big screen in her first dramatic role since Beloved and received high praise for her powerful performance as the often lonely wife of Forrest Whitaker's character, a White House butler who served eight presidents. The butler could bring Oprah her second Oscar nomination in a supporting role. The color purple was her first. Everything you are and everything you have is because of that butler. He met me at a party and swept me off my feet. I fell in love with the name Jasmine. Kate Blanchett's flawless performance in Woody Allen's Blue Jasmine has earned her Oscar frontrunner status. Anxiety, nightmares, and a nervous breakdown. There's only so many traumas a person can withstand till they take to the streets and start screaming. Soon you'll be gone, you 
never to return. Don't start with that. Father, you broke his heart when you moved away. That is wildly unfair. You were Beverly's favorite, you know that. I'd prefer to think my parents loved their children equally. An acid-tongue, pill-popping, Midwest matriarch battling cancer and reacting to a family tragedy? It is the perfect role for Meryl Streep in the film version of the Pulitzer Prize winning play, August Osage County. For the record, Meryl owns three Oscars and has earned a record 17 nominations. I may have a shot. She was James Bond's boss and twice played a queen, but it is a very different role Dame Judi Dench plays in Philomena. The film is based on the true story of an Irish woman's 50-year search for the son she was forced to give up for adoption when she was a poor and unwed teenage mother. The sci-fi thriller Gravity left Earthbound critics and film festival goers searching for more superlatives to describe Sandra Bullock's performance. She plays a medical engineer on her first mission in space. After an accident separates her from veteran astronaut George Clooney, Bullock struggles to survive high above the Earth. There are many up-and-coming talents as well. We've selected the following young actresses with promising careers. How do you know my name? You go to the same school. You wouldn't huh. know who I am. Shailene Woodley's A-plus performance in The Spectacular Now follows her award-winning role as George Clooney's older daughter in The Descendants. The whole universe depends on everything fitting together. Ten-year-old Coven Janae Wallace, who captured our hearts and was Oscar nominated for Beasts of the Southern Wild, appears in 12 Years a Slave and plays Annie in the upcoming movie musical. Hello? Hello? Hannah Simone, best known for the sitcom New Girl, graduates to the big screen in Spike Lee's Old Boy. Hey, whoa, absolutely not. Hey, whoa, no, no, no. Look, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Chloe Grace Moretz, kicking her way to fame, returned in Kick-Ass 2. Two years ago, Chloe co-starred in the Oscar-nominated Hugo. Fix something. Did you speak to any of the victims? I've spoken to all the victims. Really? What did Lindsay say? Katie Chang sparkled in Sofia Coppola's The Bling Ring. Battle. Natalie Dormer's career is on the fast track. She appears in Ron Howard's Rush and keeps her royal day job in HBO's Game of Thrones. Pardon me. Time to test your indie IQ. She produced E.T. and the Jurassic Park trilogy. She is Kathleen Kennedy, now the president of Lucasfilm, who wrote and produced Private Benjamin, Baby Boom, and Father of the Bride. Nancy Myers, who also directed What Women Want. This French-American actress is also an Oscar-nominated screenwriter. The answer is Julie Delpy, who wrote Before Sunrise and Before Midnight. That's our show. I'm Pat Collins for Incredible Indies.